has been a survivor of someone they've lost to violent crime. The next young lady I'm going to bring up, and first off, I, I'm going to apologize because we are totally out of our time for praying. Totally. But we're going to let it do what it do. Amen. The next young lady I'd like to call to the microphone, though, I've been working along with her for a while. She's an author, a mother, an amazing individual. That's the least I can say about this young lady. But in 1991, her world was literally turned upside down by a situation that not only did she hear about, but she witnessed. So I'm going to call to the mic my close friend and partner in the struggle, Ms. Danielle Richardson. Because what goes on in so-and-so house is going on in your community. That's right. 
And when you don't speak on it, when you don't talk about it, you don't recognize it, or you don't be there for that person, when that deadly day comes, it's not only going to look bad for that family, but it looks bad for that community. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody wants to know, well, well, where was so-and-so when that was happening? Oh, ain't nobody know that this was happening to that person. But everybody knew. Everybody just didn't to see them. Right. So when my mom was going through what she was going through, we love her mom a lot of people. A lot of people knew what was going on. But they choose to say, well, that's their business. We ain't going to worry about it. Now, in these days of time when we got a state that's number one in the nation, we have, what, 50 states? And South Carolina is number one in domestic violence. So that means out of every five women, these three of them being beaten. At least one of them going to get killed. And at least the other one going to have children who are sitting there witnessing the death the struggle in life, and then that child was going to grow up thinking that, well, I seen my grandmama getting beaten. I seen my mama getting beaten. So it's okay for me to get beaten because that's how he loves me. And you can't have that. Not only that, we have to teach our children how to love one another inside our household so they can learn how to love each other when they get outside the household. The love of life has got to love, love all the time. You know, if you see someone next door and they're going through stuff, and you see their they children going through it, because you know the children going through it if the mom and the daddy going through it. Sometimes you might can't get to the mom and the daddy, but the children, they're always looking for an outlet. They're always looking for somebody to talk to. So I know when I was in school, there was plenty of times when I cried upon my friends and close family members. Like, I can't go home. I walk around downtown, up and down King Street and Wheaton Street all day long until next time to come home because I didn't want to go face what I had to face at night. Mm. So just imagine in your community kids who walking back and forth in the neighborhoods in the dark because they don't want to go home because they don't want to face what's going home. And that is the time when you see that, don't ignore it. You go to them, you ask them what kind of help you can. You know, some people you can't make face, you know, and say, hey, I know you're being abused, let me help you, because a lot of time when people are in that situation, they don't, not saying that they don't want your help, they just don't want to be ashamed. So that don't mean turn your back on them just because they, you can't get to them and you can't reach them at that time. But now, today, that they have people like my sister's house, Real Mad, Project Unity, different organizations that have ways of privately helping people. And those times, my mama didn't have those outlets. And for me to be able to stand here and to be able to talk, I feel good that I'm helping see my mama once again every time I try to see one of you all. They take the initiative as a community, when you leave here today, that I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. I am my grandmother's keeper. I am my next door's keeper. Because what happens to me happens to the whole community. What happens to you happens to the whole community. Right now, it's, it's um, February. And since August of last year, we had 22 people murdered from domestic violence. Mm. Some are men, women, and some are children. Some, right now, they got the crazy mess going on with tax money. The people killing their whole family over a tax refund. Mm. Over a few thousand dollars that gonna be spent in a month. No, no, no. Children are, are being taken out of this world. Yeah. We got mm. to do better. Yes. Now, I've been in a fight over these last few years and months we've been going through with going back and forth to Columbia fighting to get some of the domestic violence laws to be able to change. And right now we got the vote number three that's out. And we have some senators that feel that well, we need guns. We got the right to carry guns. So we gonna carry guns and we want to carry guns and if you know somebody get killed, hey, that's our second amendment right. 
But if you got abusers out here who already been in jail for CBB constantly, do you allow them to have and keep carrying the same guns that you know that they're going to use to kill their spouse? Well, we're trying to get that law to change. And we need to each and every one of y'all to start calling into the senators and into, the, into Columbia and emailing them so they can vote to be able to pass this law so they can take the, can, the guns out of the hands of these abusers. But also, we want to be able to help you. We need our advocates. They need better equipment and things so they can be able to help these domestic violence victims. Because a lot of times we have shelters and we have a lot of community outlets where they can go at. But a lot of times a lot of people are afraid of getting turned down because of certain things. So they don't think they have enough money to be able to get out of this situation. But they are help out here and we gotta make sure that we are known and be available to say that hey, we are here to help you. Amen. We don't have to go through this alone. Amen. So when you, when you see my sister house or real bad or party unity or any one of these groups, they come down here and they, they're speaking or you see they have something to go and support them because they are here to be able to help you. Yes. Not all of them are victims, but there are people who are saying that they are they're tired. They are pissed, they are mad because they're tired of seeing these women getting killed or beaten or these children going through things over and over and over again. And I want to uh, close out and sit down and then somebody else have to make. I want y'all to be able to take a pledge in the heart. You know, when you go out and you, when you know what's going on, you see something going on, reach out and help that next person. Amen. Even if they're just telling you that, just give them a hug and say, I love you. That I love you, I give you, that carry more powerful, more heartfelt, more than words can ever explain. You, know, you love that neighbor because the Lord says so. Amen. And thank you, and I thank you for your time. And also, you know, think of me. I was a child who grew up in this stuff. I was a child who closed their own mama's eyes before a quarter even can come. I was a child who was raised basically on your own, a child who adopted her younger brothers so, so that they can be able to have a peace. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a person that's here to tell you your story so that one day that you can be able to help change somebody else. Amen. Thank you. testimony that will empower others to stand up against domestic violence. That's what's going to take, standing up against domestic violence. I see within the household, that we do have uh, uh, the, one of the, I believe the CEO of Real Mad in the house, Mr. Butch Kennedy. But would you please stand up and raise your hand or something like that? I wanted to acknowledge Butch because Project Unity that he also is with, they have a website on the internet that you can go to actually. It's uh, www.projectunityusa.org. You can go there, click on the tab that says report a crime, right on there, who, what, when, where, how, whatever you've seen about any, anything, hit submit and it's anonymously reported. You see, you don't have to worry about retribution, people coming back at you and carrying on. You just need to go use the internet. So a lot of these things that we're talking about today, and there's a lot of crime out here that's gone unsolved. I'm a little ahead of what we're talking about because I'm talking about one of the solutions, but I want you to know, I gave everybody a card. Well, not everybody, I passed out some cards in here that's got the website on there, please. You use it, encourage others to use it, pass that number around. The more we get this out there, the more those who have lost loved ones to violent crime, be it domestic or otherwise, who have gone, uh, these things have gone unsolved and they have no closure, maybe now we can begin to turn this thing around and arrest these killers and make your community safe, because that's the one thing I think I'll hear from Smurf in a minute. If you keep letting the killers go because you won't say nothing, how long before it happened to you? 
And in saying that, I want to actually bring to the microphone, if he's going to say a couple of words for us, as we transition into the part of this program that we talk about solutions, you see, because we'd be really wasting our time if we just stood up here and talked about the problems, the issues, what has happened. What we need to look at is what we can do to make this not happen no more, okay? So I'm going to call up to the microphone, actually, uh, if he's going to speak, Deputy Chief Tony Elder with the City of Charleston Police Department. A good friend. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, very glad to be here, and I must tell you that I'm very humbled by everyone who is here, uh, particularly those who are survivors, and as I heard earlier, overcoming um, these tragedies. I brought with me, the, uh, because I, I actually sent an, uh, an email and said, what is the topic of discussion a little deeper than stop the violence? Because that can mean so many things and so many different dynamics. And then uh, Mr. Bertha sent me uh, domestic violence, which actually made that uh, a little bit more focused. So I brought with me, not knowing if this was going to be as large of a group as this or not, and what the community involvement was going to be, statistics, numbers, or as the representative said, the, uh, where we're at in the totem pole. Uh, because I wasn't sure if that's where we were headed. And my heart tells me after listening to everything, that's not where we're headed. We know that, okay? We know where we've been. I can tell you that in the city, we roughly have three to 500 domestic violence CDVs a year. There's only 365 days in a year, and yet we have more than average on one a day that we have to investigate. So let that resonate, and that's just in the city, not in the county and all of the other jurisdictions and the entire state and the United States and the world. So just let that resonate a little bit with you. To talk a bit about solutions, you know, first off, we have put certain things in place that we hope have helped uh, first, we have taken our advocates and increased them. Uh, we have taken the advocates and created, under the vision of Chief Mullen, the creation of our family violence unit. And in that family violence unit is not just the advocates, but it's the investigators and mental health professionals. We've got them actually partnered with us to do those things. The second thing that we put in place, because remember, a lot of these things happen in private. How does law enforcement get engaged to stop something happening in your home? Okay. How do we get engaged in the inside environment? We had a first increase in almost nine years in crime, in violent crime, last year. Okay. Now we do deal with numbers, but let me just share this with you. One is too many on any crime, and in particular violent crimes, and especially domestic violence. Yeah. One is too many, okay? So we had our first increase and we looked at that and it was in the area of aggravated assaults and domestic violence. So we dug deeper into that. And what we found is the vast majority of them were indoors. And the vast majority of them were either related domestically or acquaintances and knew one another. At a barbecue and something said, and then someone breaks someone's head, okay? So when you think about that in law enforcement, how do we get engaged in that when most of the time we're gonna be responding to, okay? That's not preventative, that's responding to. And it's in your house. So one of the things that we also put in place is we're not just responding to it, we're trying to identify them that are ongoing and repetitive in nature and getting engaged in it. For example, from now on, uh, what we have done since last year is within 24 to 48 hours, normally 24, when we respond and take and handle, whether it's a crime that actually occurred or just somebody who is actually being reported for assault and we're investigating it, we respond within 24 hours back to that house with a patrol officer not to investigate, not to arrest, but to get engaged and to ask, how are you doing? 
How's it going? What can we do? How can we help? And then on top of that, you have the immediate follow-up on every single domestic violence. So right, right now, what I'd really like to do is just recognize all of the advocates in the room, all of the mental health professionals, and all of the organizations, and the folks who are investigating these domestic crimes, because they see every one of them every day. Imagine if you went to work every day and that's what you saw, little kids involved in things. So if they could just rise, any of them that are involved in that, I would like to give them a hand for what they're doing. Any organization, any of the advocates, thank you. Thank you all. So another thing that we're doing in the city is we actually created a risk assessment tool. So when we get involved in these things, we try to determine what are the tangible risks in this particular incident that might cause us to have to get even more engaged and get more people to see it's not just us. It's not just those of us in uniform or carrying a badge or those hired by the law enforcement community, okay? It's everyone in this room. And I'm gonna tell you something, Besides maybe a couple of very passionate meetings on some things like the Central Business District and a few other things, this is the largest group that I've seen in the 30 years in law enforcement to actually go and meet together to address this specific issue unless it was a conference. But from a community perspective, thank you. We aggressively investigate all of these. We coordinate and share information with all of the other agencies and get whoever we need to, whether it be private organization, faith-based community, uh, whether it be other jurisdictions, the county, the state, SLED's here, thank you. The county is obviously here. This is their area, but we partner very well together to handle these things, and including crime prevention offices for all of us. We get as many resources as we can involved in this because it's not our problem. It's our problem, the community's problem, every one of us. And what was said earlier about community involvement, and in essence, if you see something, say something, that is so powerful. That's the resolution. The resolution is you get engaged. You don't hide it. You don't let it just become a silent issue. That's the resolution, in my humble opinion. The other thing that we've done, and it's very interesting, and thank y'all for putting this together, and I heard the next meeting about the youth coming here. Yeah. This year, one of our initiatives in the city is we're trying to create what the chief has defined as listening sessions. So what do we mean by that? It means we wanna go out to the things like this with our officers and have the officers sit with the youth and listen. Listen to what they have to say. Not just about the good things and the great things that maybe we're doing, but how can we get more involved? What are we missing? And perhaps what is their vision of what we do? Try to help them understand what we do and then also listen to maybe what we should not be doing, okay? Listening to all of them and listening to the use is very powerful because we're gonna change things here, not necessarily in the eyes of the people in this room, but in the eyes of the people you're gonna go home to, and some of you young guys and ladies are in here, that's where it's gonna change, it's a generational issue. And we have to stop it at that level. We have to be engaged and involved in those individuals. You know, one of the things that I do is, I, and, and uh, if you don't mind, the council member now representative, we have stood on a street many nights, looking down and asking why, okay? Then what happens as we get engaged in these things and we hear the different tragedies that have occurred and the tragedies we've heard here today is we go home and I have a 10 year old and a 30 year old and a wife and in-laws who live with me, okay? Two cats and a dog. <laughs> and fish. So I go home and sometimes I've been called out at night more often than not on these and it's cold and it's, it's my son has asked to sleep with me that night because it's dad's weekend. But I get back up just like our people do and we respond out to that cold, dark, lonely street and there's the tragedy. Now I go home after that. First thing I do is I kiss my son as he's sleeping. I'm blessed that I have the relationship that I have. I kiss my wife and I wake my daughter up in Virginia and call her. 
because it's a family thing for me and I'm blessed with that. But in seeing that, it makes me wonder not what we can do, but what we must do to stop this. We must do things to stop this. And we do that by getting involved, getting engaged. Now I'm going to say something. I might hurt some feelings. Okay? This is very powerful with everyone here today. Please do not let time and distance cause disinterest and cause you to go away. Because that's what happens. When the crimes are not occurring, when the bullets are not flying, when the knives are not cutting, and world and life gets back in your face, the day-to-day -day grind, you go away. You become disinterested, not because your heart's not there, but because you're so involved in other things in life. So what we have to do consciously is to make sure that we stay engaged even when there's nothing going wrong. Yes. We go to community meetings all the time, and Chief Mullen does these regularly, and I'm sad to report that there are very, very little attendance. And thank you. Right. What do you want to say? <laughs> So until something happens. Okay, there you go. And what happens when something happens, and I'll give you an example, uh, one that might resonate a little bit. Daniel Island is a very, very safe community. One year, they had 11 burglars. That's important. Remember what I said earlier? One crime, one victim is too much. Okay? That's the first time I've seen that whole community at a meeting, okay? So that just is telling you that when things are going wrong, when things are going bad, we become engaged. We need to be engaged when it's going right or when we're trying to find solutions and when we're trying to resolve things together and not just after it happens. Not just while we're trying to do an investigation and our emotions are involved and then after the grieving, after the anger and the pain, we go away. So please don't do that. And I think a couple of the last things that I want to say, so I don't take up too much time. I offer to you that all lives matter. Every life. Even a criminal's life matters. And I also want to thank you on behalf of all of us who serve you for allowing us to do that. Because without you, we couldn't exist. So thank you for letting us serve. Once again, thank you to Deputy Chief Tony Elder for those potent, valuable words. I'm going to keep things going. Um, I did want to add a couple of things on to what I heard over the last few minutes. And one in particular is with, uh, I know that uh, Ms. Danielle said, as far as uh, our brother's keeper and stuff like that, you know, and I always think about these things a lot. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I don't want somebody keeping me who ain't got their act together. You know what I'm saying? You know, we gotta look in the mirror and make sure our stuff is in order. You know, how you gonna help somebody else and you just out of order and out of control? So we need to look ourselves in the mirror. And a lot of this connects through music, through, these are some of the things that I deal with that I speak about loudly on the radio. One in particular is with DJs. They'll go in the club and they'll encourage women that they don't need a man and they can do it all by themselves, all by themselves. Well, I didn't grow up that way, okay? And I had a whole family, uh, thanks to God bless my parents. And they taught me family values Amen. and how important, I promise you this, as I stare out before you guys, how important it was to have a dad in my life, actively in my life. Yeah. And you dismiss that, and that really bothers me, okay? Yeah. That really bothers me. I understand. And it's like I had a conversation with my mother and I just, I promise you, I just talked about this on the radio yesterday, where 
My mom referred to a couple of men that was in my sister's lives as losers. We ain't talking about the losers. We ain't talking about getting a man with substance in your life that's going to be there to help raise the child. Because again, at the end of the day, yes, women do a great job as a single parent of raising their kids, but at the end of the day, it really takes a whole family for us young men to get really well balanced, okay? Just like we don't understand what it would be to 100% raise a woman as a man, vice versa too. It's some things that you're just not gonna be able to connect with that a dad or a real man that's active in a child's life is gonna be able to do. So, you know, I wanna encourage, especially our women, please change your mindset on that. You know, and one other thing I'll say real quickly is the fact of the matter is, this just happened, it's been in the news, everybody knows about it, whether it be Ray Rice or whether it was, um, Adrian Peterson, and or even if I could mention too, um, Chris Brown. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know what I got on the radio from our young women? Well, what did the girl do? That bothers me. That really bothers me. Now, one just happened two days ago. This is a rapper, one hit wonder, if you will. His name was Afro Man. Young lady came on the stage, and he just hooked and knocked the girl out. I got comments, I, I put on there, shaking my head, all this other stuff, you know. I got comments from the women, well, what did she do? Or I bet you she won't go on the stage again. That bothers me, the mindset of our young women thinking that they are the problem, they're, they're the actual victims, but they're making the guys out to be a victim, and they're the ones moving their lives and getting beat. So we have to change the mindset of our young women out there to know that as it's been resonated and said over and over and over again, including by the chief, one time is one time too many. Because when it comes to, let's say, Ray Rice, if you will, it's like, when you see him knock this young lady out, okay, that's bad enough. But then he goes to just walking over like she's garbage. You mean to tell me that was the first time that ever happened in that relationship? Come on, y'all. And that's what we need to get to. One time is too many. Hold up. You just raised your hand to me, that's not cool, uh-huh. And at the same time, let us make sure we're addressing it, even as the nosy neighbor. What's going on over there? You all right? Oh, don't worry about what, what we got going on. No, no, I need to be worried. There's a lot of commotion, a lot of fuss going on. What, what's happening? Talk to me. And even if they don't, then you just have to be the one to say, you know what? Let me make that call right there on behalf of that person. I promise you, after a while, they'll come back and thank you. That's what I say on the radio all the time. You may not like what I say. I'm probably getting on your nerves or whatever. But in the long run, it may even take you 20 years for that light to click on. But when it quits on, you'll come back and thank me. I said I wanted to get some shirts made like that. You'll thank me later. And that's what we need to be with, you know? I may too be a busy body and too nosy, but I promise you, you'll thank me later because nothing is more valuable than a human life, all right? We want to keep things moving, and I thank you for letting me get that out because that was really heavy on my mind. Here. But I would like to call up because she's going to continue to give us information on some valuable information and what we could be doing in the community to make sure we stamp this violence, senseless violence out. I would like to call up uh, Ms. Condria. I believe she's out here. Is she out here? <laughs> Ms. Condria LaGree Taylor. My old, my my stomping ground. Um, pretty much, I'm from Johns Island. I went to school with Dwayne. I went to school with Melinda. I went to school with Trimmy. So basically, back in the day, it was it took a village to raise a child. Ain't too much villages going on no more. One time before, when I used to get in trouble, the neighbor beat you. Yeah. Your mama beat you. Yeah. Your daddy beat yeah. you. Auntie, uncle, everybody yeah. beat you, right? Mm -hmm. So now it's like, I don't want nobody to say nothing to my child. Don't say nothing to this. Don't say nothing to that. No, you got to do better than that. Try and tell you. It's getting to the point that we are losing our kids. And to piggyback on some things that were said as far as raising our boys to be men, I am proud of my three. Um, I have three boys, 
I woke up Valentine's Day morning with a rose by my head from my older son. I raised him how I want him to go. He's usually here. Matter of fact, he's in the back somewhere. My kids are always with me when I come to these events. But another thing, too, I've been out trying to basically fight the violence from coming to Johns Island and keeping the people that's out of Johns Island in Johns Island. Basically keeping the, the murderers and the killers and the dope dealers in their own area. But then guess what? It spilled back over here. We ain't had this much violence in a long time. How many people can raise their hand and say we had this much violence on John Dollar and Woman Law put together? Nobody? No hand? A few? Five, six, seven? Now we getting them every other week or every other month. You know what I'm saying? It's getting to the point that it's getting ridiculous. Even with the men, I went, I went through domestic violence. I wouldn't call it domestic violence because I was raised, he hit me, I hit him back. <laughs> Point blank. My mom, my dad didn't teach me to be, to just sit there, you know. He hit me, I hit him back. And he see you hit him back, and sometimes, usually they stop, but now they, they get to the point where they don't even stop no more. You got to really fight them. So, you know, it's been, but it's been to the point that even with men, you got some men that won't tell that they're being abused. You got some girls that are saying that they, you know, they won't be abused or he's not going to do this and he's not going to do that. I've been through the whole scenario. I went through parents with abuse. I went through that. I even went through it myself. I wouldn't call, like I said, I wouldn't call it abuse because we fought. I, I just figured fighting was different than abuse. But um, it's not. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? And I even had it to where I raised my three boys for a year, two years by myself, and my husband came back into the household. So it is hope that it can happen. We got, for women, we got to stand up and say what we got to say. We can't allow these guys to put their hand on us all kind of way and then just don't say nothing. And home, you know, homegirls, best friends, if you know your homegirl getting beat up, then you should say something. That's right. If you got anonymously called and say, hey, someone so is getting beat, you got to. I don't know if you remember two or three years ago, Zakia Lawson lost her life. She was murdered. The guy killed himself. That was my husband's first cousin. I looked at her as a sister. I don't have any sisters. So when that happened, that tragedy happened, it affected my life too. They say for one homicide, one murder, it affects seven people. Am I right, Auntie Stuff? That's my auntie over there. But for one homicide, one murder, it affects seven, seven families. So we got to get active. We got to continue doing this. And as they were saying, we've been to plenty community meetings and they, this is the biggest crowd ever. I mean, I went to North Charleston meetings just because, you know what I'm saying? And like she, I met mean, one of the family, Dwayne, I had to, and, and I had to take my kids off of the island too to go to play sports. Sid, I always tell you, I want my boy to play baseball for you, right? We need to bring that back. We have plenty of things we used to do on the island. We can't even do it no more. We need for our community leaders to listen to what we got to say. Some of us younger folks, we can put our fingers on some of the things that are going on in the community. We just need somebody to listen. You know what I'm saying? We need for y'all younger folks to come out to the community meetings and get in, go and get ready to the vote. You know what I'm saying? Ain't nothing wrong with learning how to, to vote. Go out there and get ready to the vote. Don't be too proud of the vote. You know, I, I was trying to get my son to even work at the voter's registration. You know, we have to do our part too. It's not a black, white thing. My son's godmother's white. I always tell people, I don't see that color, the situation. Stop blaming other people for what we got going on at home. Be responsible for what you got going on at home. If your son is beating his girlfriend up, then nine times out of ten, you need to say something to your son. If your daughter is beating her boyfriend up, then, then you need to say something to, your, to her daughter. You know, you have to do it because if you don't, we're going to keep losing them. We're going to keep losing them day by day day by day. And it's hurtful to see, I didn't even go to any of the funerals. I went to see Dwayne's face. I couldn't even go to the funeral. I couldn't even go to Melinda's funeral. I went to see the face. We all grew up. That's the bad part. You know, we always thought we were going to be young forever, but we're not. 
you know. But we need our community leaders to back us too, as far as our age group. And you know, I have to give a, a big, big clap up to Smurf and Dixon and you know, Mr. Gilliard and DJ Cad, even though he didn't never accept me on Facebook. But uh, <laughs> put you on blast. You and my neck in the woods. You know, Danielle, me and Danielle write together for so exquisite magazine. <laughs> I always have people say, why are you always why are you always going that place? Because it never really happened here. That's right. So now I got to come back home and do the same that I've been doing out there. And that's being an advocate. I call myself an advocate because I come out I don't have a, a shirt or a certificate. I don't need all that good stuff. I don't need nothing to say what I do. I don't need to boast and brag about it because it makes me feel good at the end of the day. I don't have to come up here and just to be saying, well, okay, I did something. Oh, well, it's not a medal for me. It's not, you know what I'm saying? I'm just getting tired of it because like I said, I got three boys, soon to be a grandmother. <laughs> Sorry, son. You know, I know I look, I know I look good for the age, but, um, <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah, he's back there recording. Um, but yeah, soon to be a grandmother, and I don't want nobody coming into my home kicking in my door. Or I don't want nobody coming into your home kicking in your door. Because like I said, when it affects you, it affects me, it affects them, it affects everybody. And I mean, that's, that's all I gotta say today. Thank y'all for your time. Appreciate those words. I definitely send. You know, I'll be sending you a, a Facebook request and a friend request. <laughs> um, also, too, you know, when you speak about uh, domestic violence, just keep in mind it's not one-dimensional. When it comes to domestic violence, it's just not somebody putting their hands on somebody else. Verbal abuse, too, because if you think about it. You know, if you're verbally abusive to somebody and they decide they don't have no self-worth and kill themselves, it's almost just the same as pulling the trigger. So keep it in mind that definitely domestic violence runs way deeper than just the physical part. Uh, also, when we're talking about folks not being afraid to go out there and tell somebody if you see something, a lot of times we looked at that, especially on the street level, as, a, a, as they call it, a snitch. Okay, and that's almost a code to the street now for the young people, because sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm speaking to the wrong crowd now, because I like to, as I look out upon you folks, that y'all are the get it folks, so to speak. And I, I feel that the generation before me, which would be my parents and stuff, and my parents are 75 now, that was almost the last of the get it generation. They got it, they knew the family values, how to go out there and work and raise children and stuff like that. And we've kind of lost our way somewhat. So we need to kind of bring it back home. And one of the main things was snitching. When you think about that, that word in the street is, regardless of anything, I ain't got nothing to say. I ain't seen nothing, I heard nothing. And coming from the streets of New York, that's the way I actually kind of feel up too. And at the same time, when you take that mindset again, are you gonna really have that mindset if it's your son, your daughter, your family member, I'm quite sure you would want to seem like a canary if you saw somebody that harmed you. So, I, I, you know, it's hard for me to distinguish and understand the disconnect we have sometimes where, okay, ain't my family, I'm all right. But as soon as your family, now you're mad at the next person because they won't say nothing and they know. And the bottom line at the end of the day is somebody is walking free who just took a human life. And when, I'm not going to go in that direction because there's some young men out there right now that took a young woman's life in Monk's Corner, correct? Exactly. That's still walking out there. I don't even see how it is on their mindset and their conscience that they could actually eat, sleep, and just go about their business knowing you took a human life. It just, the, the value of life, is just, it, it just continues to boggle my mind. And here to speak on somewhat about the snitch, snitching type of way we look at things when we're out in the street because it may jeopardize our street credibility or something, is our own Papa Smurf. He's gonna come up here and speak about that just for a few minutes. Hey, how y'all doing today? I'm honored to be here. I, I really am. But I wanna start off by saying this. I don't know nobody in this room who's been to heaven. 
He came back and told me there is one. But I'm going to make preparations for heaven and get there and find out whether there is or not. And not be ready for heaven and get there and find out there is one. That's me. Now, this is a distinguished panel up here. I'm the young one of the panel. And you see the subject they gave me to talk about. It wasn't because they said, we need someone to speak. They gave me this panel to talk about this because this is what I lived for so long. I lived in that life. I was a part of that life. All right, now. I know you hear all over me, the, the distinguished senator. Um, oh, he loves that. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying, the senator called me, and I'm going to call him senator. Okay. Called me Papa Smurf. And it's the reason why I asked him to do that. Because behind that name is a history. Y'all might not know it, but y'all might have heard of it. I was involved in one of the biggest drug deals here in Charleston, South Carolina. I got arrested with Henry, Henry Judy Benny in Huge, South Carolina. What happened to me during that process was I couldn't tell. I might have lost my life. But a distinguished gentleman who's not here no more that the police force might know about, named Mickey Watley. He was a uh, lieutenant for Slay. And at that time, the FBI and Slay came and got me. They wanted to pull me out the cell and talk to me. And I said, I'm not coming out there to talk to y'all. You know, everybody see me talking to y'all, they don't think I'm telling. <laughs> no, I ain't talking to y'all. And the weirdest thing about it was, that ain't why they pulled me out the cell. They pulled me out the cell because Mickey told me, I think I can help you. I said, well, how can you help me, Mickey? Only thing you want me to do for you is tell them somebody. No, you can't help me. But as a result of Mickey Watley, who ended up working with SLED. He was in North Charleston. I think he was at County 2. Chief or whatever. I don't know his, what he had, his title. The man saved my life. Literally saved my life. All right, now. What he did for me was he gave me a mirror to look in. He didn't give me a story about, well, if you do this, you're going to end up in jail. If you do that, you're going to end up in jail. He gave me a mirror and said, look at yourself. And that's what I did. I looked at myself. Now, I knew I couldn't just get away with what I did. I knew I had to go to prison, and I went. And I went for a good little time. But through prison, I studied. I started to read books. And one of the biggest things I found out in them books, and I hope I don't offend nobody, because I'm from Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. I ain't over this side here. <laughs> so I ain't gonna start no trouble, because it's a long way to get back to Mount Pleasant. <laughs> but let me tell you, I found out one of the biggest lies that started my transformation. And that was when they told me the white man was the devil. I said, oh my God. Oh my God. All these years I went believing that. That, oh, this white man is holding me down. Oh, this white man, this, oh, this white man. And I'm a history buff. I study history a lot. I know it down pat. There's nothing you can bring up in history that I don't know about. Because I spent 73 months studying it in prison, over five years studying history. But when I start to realize that these Caucasian people, is that a better way to say it? <laughs> no, my light-skinned brothers, I'll say that. My light-skinned brothers was not my enemy. I said, well, what else have y'all been lying to me about? I said, if these guys, if Mickey Watley can come to jail simply because he sees something in me, it's a shame he's dead now. Because I think he would have been honored to see me stand up here now and talk. But to see something in me enough to say, you somebody. And I'm not going to preach you here as a mirror. Just look at it. That's what I did. So if they could lie to me about that, they're lying to me about a whole lot of other stuff. <laughs> now normally I bring my transcripts. It's a big transcript. Everything that was said in court. And if I had brought it, but I'm going to tell you, most of them know it. I was told on. I was told on, and I was the low man on the totem pole. They told on me. They tried to push everything on me. But I manned up to it, and I stood, and I said, here I go again being proved that this whole thing I've been taught, told all my life is a lie. There's no honor among thieves. There's no honor. The, the boat has sunk. The shark is eating him. Why should I go back and try to save him? I'm swimming for myself. That's right. So they put me up. And they said, Smurf did it. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I came here today. I came here to talk to not the older people, but well, I'm going to say something to y'all too, but to the younger brothers that constantly hear this word snitch. 
Y'all hear it? Ah, oh, don't snitch. Don't snitch. You know who started that? We did. <laughs> we thought that was a way to intimidate y'all, because who could best tell me about the drugs I was cooking than the person who was sitting there cooking it with me? The police wasn't there. They wasn't there when I was doing it. They don't know what happened, but they do. So now I gotta make sure I'm just using that again. <laughs> now I gotta make sure she don't tell. <laughs> If you tell, you stitch it. If you tell, you stitch it. So I went on and on and on. So I started to realize that got out of control. You know, it really got out of control. Because any man who commits a crime, listen to me now, an act that is wrong and goes against the dignity, I would normally say state, but I'm gonna say war to law, that goes against the dignity of war to law, needs not walk the street. Period. Right. If we can kill somebody, we shouldn't be left to kill another one. And if any one of y'all in here can stop that, you just prevented yourself from getting killed. Yours from getting killed. And the weirdest thing about it, because many of y'all might not have been there, I've been there, is once we get in themselves, we start to realize it. Yep. But it's too late. We got 35 years with the new, um, Non-parolable offense, the, the um, war on drugs, they don't no longer get parole for violent offenses. So if you get 30 years, you're gonna do 28. Mm. 28 years. Well, I was fortunate again. And I think Mickey Watley went up there and said something, I ain't gonna lie. I think he went and talked to Judge Victor Rawls. And this was all in my transcript. This is after the trial. When the judge asked me if I had anything to say, and Lord, I got up there to talk. The legs were shaking because I knew how much time I was getting ready to get. But I realized that what I was faced with was a lie. And the same thing I'm standing before you today talking about is what I said in court. Your Honor, they told me not to snitch. But you see how many people came in here today and pointed the thing at me, Your Honor. And Judge Victor Wall said, yes, I understand, but I can't over, this is all in my transcript. I normally bring it with me. He said, I can't overlook what you did. I have to sentence you for accordingly to your crime. 30 years, no, I said, Lord, how you think I need 30 years to straighten up? 30? No, y'all, honor, not 30. Not 30, not for them telling on me and, and they got the bill running. I had a public defender. She didn't do much for me, but it's bad. But I was getting ready to get 30 years? And all oh, I broke down. But Victor Rawls said to me, this is all in my transcript. You can go online and look it up. You were the only person in all the years, I forget how many years he told me he was on the bench, that ever came up here and talked about snitching. And because of that, I'm going to suspend your 30 years and give you five. Mm. And I looked at that judge, and all I could do, because I'm going to prison now, is smile. <laughs> but what I did after that, I smiled at him, I'm not going to lie, I smiled. I turned around and looked at my mama, and I remember that old saying, Boy, you got a praying grandmama. <laughs> As a result of that, I advocate that if any one of y'all believes snitching is wrong, you're wrong. Because if someone kills somebody out here in this community and you let them go, all you've done is boost their ego. Now you're telling them, I can do it again. You let your video prove it. And we can't do that no more. We have to stop. We cannot allow our children to continuously die by our children. If you leave your gun home, and I leave my gun home, we both going home. And that's more important. There's no way you can sit in here and say, because two police officers, y'all know the story, did what they did, that that means all police officers bad. Because I'm going to call you a liar. I know a man named Mickey Watley. And he was a good cop. Just like Chief Mullins had the opportunity to meet this dude who's adamant about getting me in there when he got these guys to talk to. No, I want to talk to you, sir. Even at one point, he told me I don't want to talk to Pastor Dixon. I want to talk to you. Why? Because you can relate to these children out here. That's how I got on this panel. 
I don't have nothing to say about all the things y'all talking about when they said no. <laughs> no. I'm talking about the stretch. I'm talking about that lie that we've heard for so long that got even mamas. You know that boy ain't got no job. And he coming in with the $300 pieces on. You know that boy ain't got no job. And he got a ride out the back door with 2061 parked in your driveway. And you know he ain't got no job. But you turn your head because every month he slides you that $200. Okay. Okay. So like the, you act like you ain't know what he's doing. You know what he's doing. You know what he's doing. You know what he's doing. But then no sooner is the street. Because what it says, yes. what I Like you, man. Don't let that dude get away. 
Call Smurf. Now you might not know how to, like the boys say, bust them guns. I do. My name carries enough weight in Charleston. That's why I like people to call me Smurf. That's why when you call me Smurf, pastor calls me Smurf. So when you see me standing here, you're looking at that. Dang, that's Smurf. Ain't that that dude who got all that money and all that? Yes, it was. But now I got something better than money. I got a piece of mind. I got a piece of mind. Now, I didn't want to do this, but there's a man in this building here who's from this, well, not from this community, but he's over here. He owns a church and he preaches over here. And if anybody desperate about Smurf, how he used to run me, because he's from where I'm from, how he used to run me out of his yard, because I was the biggest drug dealer. <laughs> I was the biggest drug dealer in my community, and my community didn't want me there. But I had a surrounding of people that wouldn't tell on me. Wouldn't tell. And that's why I'm here today to tell y'all, don't get confused with snitching. Snitching is when a criminal, me, and I'm going to use you again, hey, no, I'm going to use Cass. Me and Cass <laughs> agreed to go rob a bank. Me and Cass, we talking in the house. Cass said, OK, smart. I'll drive and you go. I said, no, I'm a team fan. <laughs> Smurf, you drive and I'll go in the bank. <laughs> okay? You drive and I'll go in the bank. <laughs> and whatever the proceeds is, we're going to split them down the middle. You get half and I get half. Nobody's role in this crime is bigger than the other. So me and Cass go and we do good. We hit the bank with our little mask on, and Raphael and James got us on the news of fire. And all y'all looking at us say, boy, if I can figure out who this is, I might get a few dollars. You know? And we get away with it. But now we ain't satisfied with that. So we go to John's Island, to the little small bank y'all got with all your money in it. And we said we're going to do this one more time. And we do it. Get away with it. But Cass, because I told him not to buy all that jewelry, he goes out there and buys them big gold chains and new rings and all them stuff. And the police get behind him. Now he get caught. Okay? Do you think if Cass tell him he's doing it to better our community? No! Cass tell him it because he want to get out. And he's serving me up. That's snitching. But when someone kills someone's son in this community, right. and one of y'all see it in your town, that's not snitching. All right. All right. That's living under God's law. That's not snitching. So really, to all your little brothers, you know, who like to listen to that music that guys talk about, they're lying. These dudes is cowards. They're lying. That lifestyle they're talking about, they're lying. They're trying to make money. Mm -hmm. And if selling violence is how they do it, they're going to sell it. And when y'all start playing into it, when mama tell you to wash the dishes and you can't wash it, I already see the world you hitting down. Amen. I already see it. Amen. So I'm humbly, because I know I went over 10 minutes, but they talk longer than me. Tell the truth now. <laughs> they don't talk longer than me. They don't talk longer than me. You know that. You in the front seat. You see how long the boy for. I'm not asking you as a pastor or a radio personality. I'm going to do it again now, don't be mad. As a senator and as a homicide survivor victim, I'm asking you all from a thug's perspective. A person who was out there polluting your community. The ones who was creating this mess to simply help me clean it up. Peace. Oh, man. I forgot to warn y'all about this gentleman I was about to bring up. The energy he was going to bring, this is what we're talking about right here. It's easy to talk about this stuff, but you need actual people that can help bring it home, and you definitely brought it home right there. As we get ready to close out, I don't even know how to follow that up. I can't follow with that energy. Sometimes I'm like that on the radio. He say when I when I get that look in my eye and I start going, I guess he's taking a page from me there, but I, I doubt that seriously. Uh, the follow-up on a couple of things he said that I thought was really interesting is, you know, when, when these gentlemen, they get in front of the judge, 
you know, we, we've seen it on the news and they, they start crying and they be like, oh, they're not tough, they punks and all that. I took it from a different perspective. I took it from the perspective that actually Smurf kind of talked about a little bit and that was, no, I think they were crying because reality actually sets in now of what they're about to face. You know, and that's the thing, we need to get to them before that point. Amen. Another thing he mentioned, I want to mention, because he, he mentioned about robberies. So because I'm in music and stuff, this is a true story. Some of you may have heard me speak about it, but there was actually two prominent rappers in the 80s. They were at the height of their careers, at their game, making good money and everything. They decided to rob a bank. You know, innocently enough. But unfortunately, and these are, you know, you hear about these rappers, as he said, and they're not doing what they say they do. These two actually did it. And it was a robbery gone bad because they killed a lady cop who actually was a young lady just starting out in the force, but not only that, she had a young kid at the time. Now, she's orphaned, unfortunately. And I say that to say, so unfortunately, this prominent rapper making all this money He's in jail for life at the age of 22. Never gonna see the light of day. Now the other one, who I believe was the actual gunman, is scheduled to be executed. And actually I believe he's scheduled to, uh, to be executed either in March or April. Now he had to stay at execution. He was supposed to be uh, executed on March 9th, ironically, which is about uh, Biggie Smalls and Notorious B.I.G. is when he was murdered, so I find that kind of eerie within itself. But to know that these two young men who made good money in this music actually now are faced with the reality of one losing his life. Unfortunately, no one is in this at all, and the other one in jail for life. So I thought that was interesting when he talked about the uh, robberies. And uh, finally, you know, I did want to mention also when it comes to uh, snitching. Another true story. I mean, it's mind-boggling. Now, I was driving back from Walterboro, and this is, let's say, about 10 years ago. And now, this is a true story. I never really followed it up, so it's my fault. But it's so mind-boggling that I, I just, I got to get it out because I don't want to waste any more time so we can close here in a minute. So the, the, the lady was interviewing the gentleman. And... She asked, well, why are you wanting an interview now? Because he's saying, I didn't do it. Hmm, that's interesting. OK, well, you didn't do it. But you've been in jail all this time, and you're set to be executed. Why are you just coming out this with now? I think y'all know where I'm going with this. Because he said he didn't want to snitch, and he wanted to be a legend in the street, so he was going to give up his own life. Ain't that something? And so when he talks about this, it just resonates heavily of where our young kids' mindset is that they're willing to give up their own life before they give up somebody that does not need to be polluting our communities and probably going to go on to do something even more heinous. So I hope those words really resonated with what he said, because it did with me, because I was able to attach it with so many different true stories. I'm actually going to follow up this story just to see if the gentleman actually was executed or whatever happened with that. So with that being said, we're going to get ready to close things out. I, I thank you all for taking the time and sitting through all the different words and words that you've heard up here. And like everybody said, just a tremendous amount of folks that came out. Did I forget? No, I didn't forget you, sir. I didn't forget you. No. This is the last gentleman we got to bring up here. And of course, he'll, uh, I guess, have everybody come up at the end as well. But he's going to lead us with, if you will, some closing remarks here as we get ready to get out of here. So let's give it up once again for Pastor Dixon. And if I can say this about this gentleman again, I, did, I haven't known him that long. I can't believe first we had Smurf putting throwing me under the bus talking about we've talked so long up here and then now you think I would forget you. But what I want to say about these two gentlemen, every time I look and I took the initiative to actually have them on my show without even getting approval because I thought it was important to have their voices on the air because I've seen they're so actively in the community, don't matter what it is. It ain't got to be just what we're doing here today. Whatever the situation is, I know in my pleasant, the young uh, white boy that was uh, stabbed to death. Uh, Y'all know about that story, right? For, for you know, some 
misunderstanding with this modern technology, whatever you call FaceTime or whatever it is. But the bottom line is, key words, young white boy, ain't got nothing to do with us. Oh, yes, it does. And he was standing before him and his family as well, just to show the amount of respect that this gentleman, along with Smurf and everybody up here, has for the community as a whole. So once again, let's give it up to Pastor Dick. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> I hope y'all have learned today. Before I proceed, which I'm, I'm going to be extremely brief because we're into that solutions area, but before I touch on it, I want to briefly first off apologize to Sergeant Harold Phillips of the Charleston County Police Department and Sheriff's Office, excuse me, for introducing him as Lieutenant Dan Lee. All I can say is I gave you a promotion in the same manner that our new senator in the house is getting out of we end up lifting around here, can you understand? We don't tear nobody down. If you need a, a, a raise, if you need a new position, if you need a new place in society, please come see us. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge Ms. Easter LaRoach over here, yes, South yes, County, yes. Yes. advocate. Yes. I don't know how she does what she does because she has to deal with a lot more when it comes to up close and personal dealing with the pain that we heard from today. Okay, a lot more. Um, DJ Cass, thank you so very much, brother. Y'all give a listen to my night. Hip Hop Factory, Hip Hop, D93. Papa Smurf and myself will be accompanying DJ Cass tomorrow evening. Mr. Arthur Chisholm, thank you for coming out. My good friend, Mr. John Henry back there, Save Our Family and Youth Annual March Representative, CEO, Chief. Okay, all right. Now before I, I, I close down, because uh, Deacon Middleton is standing behind me back here. She had checked the watch four or five times already. And I know when they get behind you, watch out. <laughs> But before I leave, we've, we've heard about solutions, okay? We've heard about some solutions. We heard from Deputy Chief Tony Elder about some things that law enforcement is doing. We heard uh, about Real Mad and the website that they have available, uh, www.projectunityusa.org. Please use that website if you know anything about anybody at any time in history. There's a lot of cold cases out here that need to be solved. A lot of mothers are still crying because they don't know who did what to their child. Help them out. Please help them out. The redefining of snitch. I don't even like to come to a microphone after Smurf. <laughs> straight up. I'm going to tell you straight up. I don't like to come to a microphone behind a Smurf because he put it down. Ain't nobody in here say they don't understand this thing about snitching. And that if you call in and report something that you ain't been involved in, that ain't snitching. Exactly. If I can understand it, you can understand it. Now finally, in solutions, I want to talk about something that we're going to need everybody's support on. And when you approach your state representatives, your senators, your councilmen, your law enforcement officers, we need to talk about something called Project Exile. This program was implemented in 1998 in Richmond, Virginia. There was a problem like we have with homicides in Richmond, Virginia, and they felt like desperate times called for desperate measures. And so what they did was, and before I go any further, I want to tell you all that I am not pro-incarceration. I am not, but once again, desperate times call for desperate measures. 1998, Richmond, Virginia decided to partner up with the federal government, and what they did was they imposed extremely stiff penalties for anyone caught illegally possessing a firearm. Let me tell you something about the murders that's happening in our community by firearms. They're not being killed with guns that people went into a gun shop and purchased, they registered and all of that. No. 
they are illegally possessed firearms. Yes. I don't know what the percentage is, but it's a high percentage of the murders that we are dealing with. They're done by people who have got a gun who are not supposed to have a gun. So what Richmond did was they said, okay, we're going to fix this problem. Anybody that's caught, anybody, grandma, the pastor, school teacher, no, no, Pookie, no, Ray Ray, anybody who is caught with a pistol that is not legally registered to them is going to prison. Mm. And they're going to prison for five years. Average, average sentencing in Project Exile was 56 months. Average sentencing. And when I say go to prison, I mean, we're not sitting in no county jail waiting on no trials. Three hots and a cot just chilling over there, got a canteen, worrying your folks and caring all about putting something on my book. <laughs> yeah, I've been up that road too, I got a number. No, when they were caught, they were shipped. If there's a trial necessary, do it up the road, because there's one thing about it that the law said, don't possess a gun illegally and you get caught, you know, you're, you're guilty. Have the trial up, up the road. The statistical value of this whole thing is within the first 10 months in Richmond, Virginia, they saw a 41% drop in violent crime, in gun-related crime. 41% in the first 10 months. There's a 93-page exit report that shouts out the validity of this program and how well it did. It did so well and it was so unthreatening to those gun proponents, the NRA, you don't know them, the ones that say, if you say anything about taking our gun rights away, we gonna, we gonna raise game, we'll spend money. The NRA donated money into the foundation to support Project Exile because they realized it was valuable and making the community safe. Well, it's time for us to bring Project Exile to South Carolina. Yes. We want to stop the bloodshed in our community. One piece of the puzzle, that's not the whole puzzle, but one piece of the puzzle is bringing Project Exile in South Carolina form, not boarded down, not broken down, but in its full strength, even strengthened, Bring it to the state of South Carolina. Give them a three-year period of advertisement or a one-year period of a six-month period of advertising. It's coming, y'all. Get ready. And when your 13-year-old walks out here with a gun and gets stopped by chance by law enforcement, you'll see him when he's 18 years old. That's the next time you'll see him. We do a couple of folks like that, two, three, five, ten people like that. We're gonna get through the go through the community. Y'all be right, man. Hey, hold this gun for me, man. Is you crazy? Are you out of your mind? I ain't got it to lose like that. I just had a baby. He'd be in kindergarten by the time I see him. Uh -uh, I ain't trying to feel that. I just got married. That's right. That's right. Five years, my wife. That's right. She gone. Everybody ain't saved, y'all. I just want to put that out as the solution that we're going to, you're going to hear more about this. We'll be talking to our legislators about this, not only here, but statewide. We, we, we started an effort up at uh, um, SC State about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, with the student population to galvanize the entire state behind this so we can push this thing through. But it's not, it's going to take a lot more than us. It's going to take the communities, not just this community, not just Wadmala, Johns Island. It's going to take James Island, Ravenel. It's going to take Smokes. It's going to take Hilton Head. It's going to take everybody in the state, Darlington, everywhere, Florence, Greenville, in order to make sure that when we go to put this thing through, ain't no senator this or representative that standing around saying, well, I think we should do this to the bill. I think we should take that out of the bill. I don't really think this is good for the people. Well, 
they were elected of the people, by the people, and for the people. And it's time for the people to stand up and say, enough is enough. And then we will take our suits back, and we'll try to do the type of things I was looking to do, and then we're going to push it through. So we're just asking everybody, please, keep your eyes and ears open. Report crime. Don't let it happen anymore around you without you saying something. Encourage others to do so. Explain snitching to them, please. And when the bills come out, when the, when the bills start going through, get behind them. Tell your pastors. Tell your pastors. It's in the Bible. Do right. That ain't no passage. But you start in Genesis 1 and end in Exodus 22. And that's what it says in a nutshell. Do right. So tell your pastors to get behind it too. Now I'm gonna let, I'm gonna turn the mic over to the this. Oh, okay, all right, all right. All right. See, I know I gotta quit too. <laughs> you good? Well, um, Miss Middleton uh, asked me to pass on the fact that we do have a, a car that's blocking someone. You know, DU six four one seven. That's a Toyota Camry, gray, and there's also another one, the JYU 418, so that's DUG 417, JYU 418, and that's a Dodge Avenger. That's Chris. <laughs> oh, okay, that's right. Well, look, I, I guess I'm going to close it on out then. I just want to thank everybody for coming out. I want to thank everybody for being patient. I know it's a little warm in here, uh, but uh, you all have sat and sat patiently. I hope you received everything that's been said today. I hope the little ones who sat so patiently uh, really uh, 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 got, got, got something, take something away from here. I, I know that with Danielle, with Smurf, I, 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 I've worked with them before. The um, survivors. Know this, you are not alone. We're, we're, we're here for you. And not only are we here for you, for this entire community, on behalf of the coalition, we're here until we see change in this community. We ain't going nowhere. So get used to seeing us around. We'll be popping up, you know. For those of you who are religious folks, if y'all want to call me pastor, it's cool. If you want to call me Thomas, it's cool. You know, don't make me no da -da -da -da. I'm here to go to work. I'm here to see change. I'm here to make sure that at the end of this year, we don't have another uh, as many death certificates written in this community as we had in 2014 and before. It's time for a change. It's time for us to take back our community. It's time for us to say enough is enough. March 21st, right back here, you speak out. Listen and learn. It's not just for the youth. As adults, you need to listen too. As parents, you need to listen to what they have to say. It's about time for us to stop telling them what's wrong with them. You don't do doctors like that. It's time to ask them what's wrong. What are the symptoms so we can fix this problem? Thank you all. God bless you. I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Hillary. As a matter of fact, let me call up here to the front. Yeah, Mr. Dimitri yeah. Wright. Philip Mack, state representative of Wendell Gilliard. And I'm going to get on out of the way, because I was just here. <laughs> My heart is just overflowing right now. I mean, everything that was said, I'm just so glad that our community came out like this today. I can't even hardly talk because I'm so full everything that was said. But we got to push forward, y'all. We got to push forward with this information. We got another event on March 21st. We gonna keep pushing. We gonna get John's album back, what Kim was talking about, the Little League. That was a great time. I remember that in the 70s. I remember that. Amalas came in the 70s. Remember I was saying, run to the road to see where the Amalas going. That was a foreign sound. That was a foreign sound to me. Now the police everywhere. Everywhere on John's Island and Wamala, really? Let's take our community back. Well, I'm not going to keep you all. Just about everything I wanted to say has been said. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming out. This is my team. I love my community. I love you all. Change is here, and we're going to make it happen. 
Thank you, thank you all. And I, I want to say on behalf of the um, Citizen Improvement Committee, which is the board that governs this community center, I want to thank you all for coming out. Community, I love you. Someone said to me once, what is your position on board the law? I'm, I'm just a citizen here who loves my island. Um, not elected, I've been appointed, and I believe I've been appointed by God to do a work in this community, and I will continue to, to do that. And just listening to, I believe it's Ms. McGree and, and the, um, the police department who said they've had many of these events throughout the counties, and this is the largest turnout, and I'm like, right, I'm, I'm Right, and if you just look around, You'll never have to ask me why I'm sending out emails at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning in regards to Ward Law, John Solomon, and what's going on. This is why I do it. I love my community. I love you, and I thank you so much. So many people that, that, you know, that I can call out um, would take a lot of time. Representative Gilliard for, for just coming in and being an advisor to us. Pastor Dixon. These guys, and I want you to know that it began with them. This wasn't a birthday thing, it began with them. A dialogue on Facebook, and I challenged them. Right. I'm a Facebook stalker. <laughs> so I said, um, young people remember that. So if you're serious about coming together as a community, on that day I said, the community center is available if you want to have a positive meeting. And they were serious. And they are the reasons why we're here. And I thank God for them. And we're going to move forward together. And we're going to make some things happen. Brothers of Zion Temple, thank you. Sisters, the Eastern Stars, thank you. I can always depend on you. And I'm going to be calling on you. Committee members, my sisters from the Church of Our Savior, Dean and Byron from Harvest, the Sea Island Chamber of Commerce, Thank you all. God bless you. And at this time, we're going to have our closing prayer by the one and only, the Reverend William Jones. And thanks, definitely. <laughs> Since we preached this event, I heard in every board meeting, Bible study from the pulpit, and I know St. James is represented in this house, along with Reverend Huggins. That's my pastor. Brother Huggins get a little ugly on Sunday mornings, but we know what she means, and, and New West, I know you here too. God bless you. I love you. Thank you so much. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we come giving you thanks for what we have heard, what we have seen. We thank you for those that have organized this, and we ask, oh God, that we do not let it go down in green. We ask to look upon those that have been uh, with with, with, with violence, with domestic violence, with those that have had violent death, for those that have survived it. We thank you, O God, that they have come and shared their story. And now that would help us that we would look around our community and be better people in our community, not only in the church but in our home, and look at those who cannot help themselves, those young people who are submitted to drugs and can't, don't know what they're doing, O God. We ask that you would be a part of that. But thank for all of the preachers, all of uh, Dixon and, and our representative who are out here with us today to say a word that we do care and to tell us that we don't have to be in the same community to hear what they have to do. But they're here because we're all brothers and sisters. We think of all our law enforcement and all our legal representatives and to our judges and all those that are here today, whether they're black, white, brown, green, we all are God's children. Help us now to maintain this, not just to be just a kickoff, but help us to return with some kind of solution to make this community, this island, those islands, and all around us a better place to live. This we ask in the mighty master the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. 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 Don't forget, if you're not registered to vote, the ladies from the League of Women's Voters is in the back. So please stop by and see them register to vote if you are not a registered voter.